Good morning, my name is Michelle Crapo and I am the conservator for the North Carolina Maritime Museum. Thank you so much for joining me today in my first inaugural installment of the Maritime Heritage Lecture Series. My talk today is titled, Don't Be So Salty, Conservation Basics, Diffusion, and Desalination in Archaeological Conservation. Um, this presentation will be a little on the long side, a little on the technical side, so if you need to take a break, feel free to come back to it at any time. So we're going to start with a brief overview of what this lecture entails. Um, the first part of this lecture will talk a little generally about what desalination is and why it is necessary. And to do so, we're going to talk at length about soluble salts, what their key properties are, and how they negatively affect artifacts. The second half of this presentation will then focus on how that salt gets inside the artifacts, and then what we as conservators do to try to remove the salt. This lecture is going to be quite vocabulary heavy, so to start things off, we're going to take some time and review some of the terms that will pop up quite frequently throughout the course of this presentation. Um, this lecture is going to talk a lot about um, the activity of subatomic particles, which as the name implies, or quite plainly, any particle or cluster of particles that are smaller than an atom. But this includes protons, electrons, and neutrons, which you might remember from our atomic diagram over here, are also essentially the constituent parts that make up a atom. Um, protons and neutrons inhabit the center of the atom, also known as the nucleus whereas electrons orbit the nucleus. Protons and electrons are subatomic particles that have an electric charge, whereas neutrons, as the name suggests, are neutral and thus have no charge. Protons, in contrast, are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. And in an ideal situation, there is equal numbers of electrons and protons within your atom, which means that these charges are balanced, that they essentially cancel each other out and that the overall atom has no net charge. Um, however, we are not particularly interested in the activities of an ideal atom. Instead, we are going to be concerning ourselves with the machinations of the ion. And an ion is a particle that has lost or gained an electron or electrons and has become electronically charged, either positively or negatively as a result, um, basically due to this new imbalance between the number of protons and electrons that are present in the atom. Ions can be monoatomic, much like our sodium ion over here, which means that they are comprised of a single atom, or they can also be polyatomic, which means they are made up of multiple atoms. They are also known as molecular ions and include things like the sulfate ion over here, which will make an appearance later on in this presentation. Um, there are two species of ions. There are cations, which are ions that have lost one or more electrons and become positively charged as a result, since protons now outnumber the number of electrons. Um, in contrast, anions are ions that have gained one or more electron and become negatively charged as a result, since the number of electrons now um, is greater than the number of protons present in the atom. Um, outside of sort of subatomic particles, we're also going to be talking about acids and bases. Um, there are a lot of different definitions for what constitutes an acid or a base, depending on the context. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to define an acid as a molecule or ion that is capable of donating a proton when it is dissolved in solution. Um, and acids are typically represented by this hydrogen proton over here, so this hydrogen um, cation. So whenever you see this H plus sign on your screen, it's going to indicate to you that there is an acid present. Um, in contrast, a base is going to be defined as a molecule or ion that is capable of accepting a proton while dissolved in solution. And that's because when a base dissolves, it produces hydroxy anions right here. So anytime you see this OH negative on screen, you can assume that a base is present. Um, and also, what do I mean by a solution exactly? Um, a solution is a mixture of two substances in which at least in which one substance is dissolved into the other and is comprised of two parts. It is comprised of a solvent, which is any substance, could be a liquid, gas, subcritical fluid, whatever, um, that is capable of dissolving another substance. So your solvent is your dissolving force. Um, and what it is dissolving is the solute, which is the substance that is dissolved. And together they form a solution. Um, there is going to be a lot of other vocabulary that crops up throughout the course of this presentation. Um, however, I will do my best to basically define them in context since they'll usually be involved directly in what I'm talking about. 
Um, the first of those is, of course, desalination. Um, so desalination is literally desalting, desalination. Um, so basically what desalination is, it's the process of removing mineral content like salts from another material. Um, usually this is talked about in the context of water or soil desalination. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to be talking about it in terms of archaeological conservation in which desalination is used to specifically remove certain substances, um, specifically soluble salts from the interior of an artifact. Um, and this includes um, all types of artifacts. It can be inorganic material like glass or ceramic or metals, as well as organic material, including like wood, leather, bone, horn, etc. Um, and the important thing to remember for our purposes is since we're dealing with artifacts here at the North Carolina Maritime Museum that have come from a maritime context, they have been buried in the ocean. Um, the ocean itself is a salty saline solution um, that, of course, desalination is very important to our processes here at the museum in terms of taking care of our artifacts. So with all this talk about salt, we should probably actually define what a salt is. Um, salts encompass a very broad category of material, but the most basic definition of a salt is an ionic compound formed by the bonding of a cation and an anion that produces a net neutral molecule. So a particle where the electrical charges are balanced and there is no overall positive or negative charge. Um, salts are generally the products of neutralization reactions between an acid and a base. Um, for example, the predominant salt in seawater, sodium chloride, is commonly made by combining hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide um, to produce a solid salt and water. Um, however, um, there's some other definitions for how a salt can be formed. Um, they can also be described as the product of a reaction between an acid and a metal or a base in a metal that results in salt and hydrogen gas being produced. Um, and in some circumstances, they can even result from the reaction between a metal and a non-metal compound like oxygen. Uh, but for the purposes of this lecture, we will mainly be concentrating on salt as products of acid-base reactions and as reactions between acids, bases, and metals. In particular, we will be focusing on soluble salts, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Soluble salts are salts that act as solutes and are dissolved by a solvent. And since we are ultimately interested in artifacts from a marine context, the solvent we are most interested in is the universal one, water. Solvents like water dissolve sol solid solutes like salts, tongue twister, um, by breaking down the intermolecular bonds that hold them together. In order to understand how water is able to break those bonds and dissolve salts like sodium chloride, um, it is important that we talk a little bit about bonds. Bonds are the forces of attraction that tie particles together, whether they're atoms or molecules. Um, there are different flavors of bonds. Covalent bonds, for example, are probably the most common type of bond and involve the sharing of electrons between particles. However, as you might expect, an ionic compound like sodium chloride and most salts are held together by an ionic bond. An ionic bond is essentially the process through which an ion is created and occurs when an electron or electrons are transferred from one particle to another, um, creating a cation and an anion respectfully. Um, while electron sharing does technically occur in this event, um, there is some sort of covalent bonding in place, it is very uneven as the electrons tend to spend more time around the anion than the cation. Um, and the dominant force of attraction that ends up um, holding these two particles together um, is the attraction between the two opposite charges of the cation and the anion. Um, this attraction and thus this type of bond are very strong. In contrast, water is held together by covalent bonds in which electrons are shared between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Um, however, it is a very special type of covalent bond called a polar covalent bond. A polar covalent bond is when electrons are distributed unevenly along that bond axis. In this case, the shared electrons spend a little more time closer to the oxygen atom than they do to the hydrogen atom. Um, this creates areas of weak, negative, and positive charge along that bond axis. Additionally, Additionally, 
Okay, there you go. Additionally, um, this also affects the water molecule as a whole um, because you also have these two non-bonding pairs of electrons on the oxygen molecule um, that are basically big and take up room and force the two hydrogen atoms onto the sort of the other side of the oxygen atoms into this tetrahedral shape. Um, this creates two sort of polar opposite regions, as you were, of relative charge. You have a relatively um, more electropositive area here by the hydrogens and a relatively more electronegative area up here by the two unbonded pairs of electrons. This gives the water molecule an overall polarity. So it has, as a molecule, regions of relative negative attraction and positive attraction. And these are called dipoles. Um, and it's these dipoles that allow water molecules to form weak electrical attractions with other particles, including ions. And now you might be thinking, wait, Michelle, you just said that ionic bonds are strong and dipole attractions and these polar attractions are pretty weak. Um, so how is water able to break bonds of ionic compounds if it's so comparatively weak in strength and attraction? And the answer to that is by sheer numbers. Um, individually, dipole attractions are very weak, but collectively, they are very strong. So in order for a solute to be completely dissolved, the solvent needs to exist in a higher quantity than the solute. And it is the total accumulative effect of the water's dipole attractions that ultimately break the ionic bonds that are holding them together um, in the solid salt crystal formation. Um, dissolution the process of dissolving or the process of which solutes enter into solution is a two-step process in which water molecules um, compete for and disrupt and ultimately place the bonds between, in this case, um, sodium chloride ions, but between you know, the salt or the solute um, that is going into solution. The first step of this process is called disassociation. Um, disassociation and comprises the initial disruption and breaking of the ionic bonds and the separations of the ion from the salt molecule into the solution. And essentially it acts like a gas for a hot second. Um, this is followed by hydration, um, where those, those bonds, those once ionic bonds are ultimately replaced by the dipole interact attractions between the ion and the water, um, thus stabilizing the particle. Um, I should also mention that this process um, a bond forming, breaking, and disassociation, and hydration is very dynamic. And at any given time, um, an ion in solution will be inhabiting any one of these states. Um, but again, due to the sheer volume of the solvent versus the solute, the, solute, the net or overall effect to the observer will be um, as a cohesive solution. The solvation process, this process of disassociation and hydration in a solvent is not, only, is not limited to underwater environments, um, but can also happen on land um, due to exposure to groundwater in the burial environment, as well as to atmospheric moisture, um, which is better known as humidity. Um, this process is called deliquescence. All salts have a deliquescence point or a relative humidity at which they have absorbed so much atmospheric water that they dissolve. Um, the reversal of this process is called efflorescence and occurs when water evaporates or is otherwise lost and the solute particles now outnumber the solvent and the bonds between the salt ions are able to reform and the solid crystal can regrow, um, which is what you see here in this picture right here. As you can imagine, um, in, in areas of fluctuating humidity or groundwater, this cycle of salt dissolution and regrowth can happen over and over again, which is one of the key properties of soluble salts in particular, and we will discuss that in a little greater detail a little bit later. In the meantime, we will briefly address some of the other key properties of soluble salts that impact archaeological materials. Um, these properties are focused on various activities that salt ions get up to once they are disassociated in solution and available to cause some mischief. All right. Firstly, salt ions in solution act as electrolytes, meaning that they can conduct electricity. And pretty much all electricity is, at the end of the day, are electrons in motion. Electrolytes thus, thus help to conduct or transfer electrons from one point to another, keeping them in motion. You can kind of think of them as members of a relay race in which the racers are ions and the baton is an electron. 
Um, the takeaway from this is that once ions are disassociated in solution, they become available to participate in a variety of different chemical reactions that deal with changes in electrical charge and state. This includes acid-base reactions. Since salts are products of acid-base reactions, it follows that they contain the components of acids and bases, um, which can then reform under the right conditions. Um, additionally, although most salts, including our friend sodium chloride, create pH neutral solutions, there are special types of salts that are themselves acidic and basic, and thus can change the pH of a solution once they are dissolved, they are called acid and basic salts. Uh, basic salts, such as sodium carbonate, are formed when a strong base is neutralized by a weak acid, um, and in which the anion is the conjugate base of the acid. Um, when in solution, um, this basic salt dis dissociates into hydroxy ions and raises the pH above neutral, um, creating a basic or alkaline environment. Conversely, an acid salt, such as bisulfate, is created when a strong acid is neutralized by a weak, weak base. In this circumstance, either the anion, cation, or both components of the salt are comprised of the conjugate acid of the weak base and contain a proton or hydrogen atom that can then disperse or disassociate when in solution, thus lowering the pH below neutral. Um, we'll discuss some examples of salts participating in acid-base reactions a little later in this presentation. Um, but for now, we are going to discuss sort of the last major property of soluble salts, um, which is their crystallinity. Um, salts in their solid state are crystalline, meaning that their constituent parts are organized in a very orderly, repeating three-dimensional pattern called a crystal lattice. Um, this pattern will generally have a very specific, unique geometry and be very rigid and take a lot of energy to maintain. When salts effloresce or precipitate out of solution, they will naturally reorganize themselves back into these crystal lattice structures and these form the crystals that we kind of associate with salts and other types of minerals. Um, the number and salt and size of the crystals that form is dependent on a lot of factors such as solute concentration, ambient temperature, pressure, and the evaporation rate of the solvent. Um, generally speaking, the more, more solute available and the slower the evaporation of the solvent, the larger and purer the crystal and smaller the yield or number of crystals formed will be. Um, conversely, the less solute available and the faster the solvent evaporates, the smaller and more contaminated the crystals and larger the yield will be. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how crystal growth impacts artifacts in the next section. Um, so now that we've identified the properties of soluble salts that make them unique, um, we'll now discuss how these properties impact artifacts, both chemically and physically, both in the underwater burial environment, but also in the post-excavation environment, including the museum environment. First off, we'll revisit our friends, the electrolytes. Um, electrolytes facilitate metal corrosion. This includes both artifacts made from metal as well as artifacts that may contain metal components in their composition, such as how um, some glass or ceramics may have uh, metal in their composition that changes their color or gives them other types of mechanical and chemical properties. Um, they do this by facilitating electrochemical systems, um, which are self-contained systems where chemical energy is transformed into electrical energy or vice versa. Um, basically, ions work to produce electrical energy or vice versa. Um, the type of system we are interested in today is what is called a galvanic system or a galvanic cell and it deals with the passage of electrons from one material called an electrode to another in a process known as an oxygen reduction reaction or a redox reaction for short. Um, this involves electrons being transferred from a material, usually a metal but not always, that is more electropositive to one that is less electropositive. Electropositivity as seen in this electrochemical series, is a measure of how likely a particle is to give up an electron and become a cation. Um, the more electropositive material acts as an anode and undergoes oxidation, in which case it gives up electrons um, and dissolves into cations as a result, um, while the cathode receives the electrons and is also where if there's any type of deposition of material, such as corrosion, um, it'll build up at the cathode.
In the context of archaeological artifacts, galvanic cells can be understood in the form of galvanic corrosion. Um, galvanic corrosion occurs when two or more metals with electropositive differences are in close proximity and exposed to an environment that contains oxygen, water, and our friends, the electrolytes. Like in the more generic example of a galvanic cell, um, the more electropositive, more reactive material will undergo oxidation, um, giving up electrons um, that will be transferred um, via electrolytic solution to the less electropositive metal. Um, it will produce cations that will then react with oxygen, water, and other ions to form a variety of corrosion products that will then form at the cathode. Uh, which is what you can see happening right here. Um, galvanic cells um, can even form between um, different metal components within an alloy and sometimes can even form in localized areas of an object um, that is even made of entirely the same material due to the presence of oxygen or acids um, that acts as cathodes in the absence of a dissimilar metal, um, which we will revisit this concept in greater detail, but um, you can see those little pits tend to build up acids and undergo their own form of galvanic corrosion. Beyond being electrolytes, once salt ions have disassociated into solvent, um, they also become available to participate in all types of other reactions, including becoming corrosion products of the very electrochemical cells they help to propagate. Um, Sometimes these products form during the burial process itself when they are still in the ocean or in the ground, such as the case with copper chlorides. Um, copper and copper alloys that are buried in chloride-rich environments will form um, various types of copper chloride corrosion products. Um, this occurs when chlorides migrate toward the surface of the artifact and then interact with copper cations, forming a mineral called nantokite. Um, as the nantokite is forming, so too are other copper corrosion products such as copper oxides and carbonates, which are probably more, which you are probably more familiar with, as they make up the majority of that sort of brown green patina that you typically see on the surface of copper artifacts. Um, the problem is that these corrosion products tend to form over the nantokite layer, um, and then when the artifact is excavated and excavated and then re-exposed to atmospheric moisture and oxygen and you know maybe there's some cracks in that patina layer that facilitate um, that transfer of water and oxygen into the into contact with the nantokite layer um, then you essentially reactivate the nantokite and it keeps corroding and will form hydrated copper chloride um, compounds like atacamite and paratacamite. Um, these copper chlorides take up a lot more space um, physically speaking, than the nantokite, which causes them to literally erupt from the surface of the overlying patina layer, often destroying the surface of the artifact um, that is preserved in those layers. Um, and this phenomenon is often called bronze disease, as you can see demonstrated by these artifacts, and it is extremely pernicious, and once started can be very difficult to stop. Um, and in the worst case scenarios, often results in catastrophic damage or complete loss of the artifact. So bronze disease is something that we are extremely concerned about when it comes to copper and copper alloy materials that have come from an ocean environment in particular. In contrast to copper chlorides, which begin their formation in the burial environments, many of the most destructive forms of iron corrosion are iron chlorides, which form largely in the post-excavation environment as artifacts begin to dry out and water evaporates. Um, this is because iron chlorides are very concentration dependent. It can only really form as that water evaporates and the solute concentration of the chloride um, ion goes up. An example of this is acagonite, or also known as acagonite, which is a corrosion project, um, product which actually incorporates chlorides into the crystalline structure. They're actually inside and part of the structure. Um, and they also tend to attract chloride ions onto the surface as well. Um, and the problem with acagonite, as much like with nantokite and its um, reduction products essentially, is that or oxidation products, is that a cagonite tends to form inside the iron artifact, um, usually at the border between the core metal and the beginning of the corrosion layers, resulting once and again in a situation where you have a corrosion product growing in a space that is much too small for it, resulting in eruptions of material through the surface of the object. And in the case of wrought iron, like these nails you see here, um, which have a very um, specific, very kind of tiered grain structure, kind of like a tree, um, you can have whole layers that just separate and fall right off until there's very little of your artifact left.
In addition to forming corrosion products, salt ions are also integral in acid-base reactions um, that occur in artifacts, especially post-excavation, that can lead to further deterioration of the artifact. This is especially true um, for iron artifacts. And we touched on this briefly in our discussion of galvanic corrosion, but the presence of an acid can have a cathodic effect on metals and cause corrosion. Um, this is because compounds made from metals and chloride ions, particularly um, iron chloride compounds like ferrous chloride, are really easy to turn into hydrochloric acid when they have contact with atmospheric water. Often this occurs in tandem with other types of corrosion activity, and what can happen is the formation of a corrosion blister on the surface of an artifact, just what you see here in this picture. Um, this blister is comprised of a thin layer of oxidized iron corrosion and is filled with a ferrous chloride and water solution that quickly becomes acidic and forms a galvanic cell and quickly dissolves the underlying material, creating corrosion pits beneath the blisters. Um, and what's more, this process is cyclical and self-perpetuating and can lead to massive material loss as these pits deepen. Acid-base reactions can also affect organic material. It's not all a metals game um, that have also come from underwater environments, especially wood. Um, and I think one of the cooler ways that this can happen is due to the presence of sulfur or sulfate reducing bacteria, um, which live in spaces where there is little to no oxygen and as such, they rely on sulfur products like sulfur to breathe instead of oxygen. Um, one of the byproducts of this metabolic process is the production of hydrogen sulfide, which in the presence of metal ions is reduced to form both metal sulfides, much like um, pyrite, which is what you see right here, as well as various species of soluble metal sulfate ions like iron sulfates, um, such as rosinite. Um, and okay, um, fine, that doesn't seem like a big deal on the surface, um, except that wooden art artifacts are rarely alone in the burial environment and are often part of composite artifacts with metals or in otherwise in some degree of contact with metals or their corrosion products, um, such as like concreted materials that come from the ocean are, in, are often contaminated with iron or other metals as a result. Um, the ensuing problem is that all these iron sulfur combinations are susceptible to being solvated by atmospheric moisture or oxidative decay in the case of pyrite um, and basically break down and turn into sulfuric acid, which tends to attack and deteriorate all components of the artifact, whether they are art organic or inorganic. We've already talked at length about how the growth of corrosion products within an artifact can lead to significant damage. Um, well, the same is true of salt crystals. Um, when artifacts are waterlogged, especially marine environment, are dried and the solvent keeping the salt ions apart evaporates, the salt crystals reform and recrystallize if they're not already involved in corrosion products or other types of mineral products. And they often reform in inconvenient places, such as in the body of a ceramic or between the ceramic body and the glaze or inside glass artifacts, and in general in areas that are much smaller than the size of the crystal that ends up growing. Um, as a result, you know, you get all kinds of physical damage like cracking and delamination and other types of mechanical damage um, that results in basically material lost as the crystal grows and expands in volume. Um, this growth is bad enough, but as we've already discussed, Soluble salts have a tendency to deliquesce in high humidity environments and then effloresce and reform when the humidity drops. And in environments where the humidity is uncontrolled and fluctuates a lot, you can end up with repeated cycles of deliquescence and efflorescence, which over time cause serious mechanical stress to build up in the artifact and can lead to some pretty catastrophic damage. This type of physical damage is the biggest threat posed by soluble salts for a lot of materials, things like ceramics and glass, and most organic materials like wood and bone and ivory. Um, even though, as we discussed, um, chemical damage can also attack them and affect them as well. So what can we as conservators do to address issues with soluble salts? Obviously, the most important thing we can do is prevent damage in the first place. Uh, we can achieve this by keeping the artifact wet, for instance, when it is recovered, um, thereby keeping salts in solution. Um, this, of course, does not solve all of our chemistry problems, as we've seen. Um, it also limits our ability to interact with and display the artifacts. 
Um, our next option is to go ahead and dry the artifact out and then try to prevent further contact with atmospheric moisture, um, which can induce more chemical and physical changes by trying to control the environment or by applying some type of barrier between the object and the environment. Um, however, these methods um, often are time and resource consuming and require constant maintenance and promise no long term gar guarantees ultimately. Um, and ultimately the best solution is to try and remove as much of the salt as possible. Now, before we get into how to remove the salt, um, let's talk a little bit about how the salt gets into the artifact in the first place. As we've covered, salts can be deposited as a result of biological activity, um, as metabolic byproducts, but also as a result of bio biological degradation of an artifact, um, particularly an organic material such as wood, which has a cellular structure, which can be eaten away by microbes, thus leaving um, an open structure behind that has a lot of open spaces for salts to travel and accumulate. Um, since these artifacts are already in a waterlogged environment and salts are already dissolved into a fluid, um, the more often and open and porous an artifact is, the more places there are for the solution and thus the salt to go. Um, so the porosity of the artifact as well the effects of erosion from sands, currents, etc. are important factors determining how far salt solutions can enter into an artifact. And while some of salt deposition is the result of sort of mechanical movement of water, you know, as in currents directing the movement of the water through an artifact, um, the predominant mechanism for how salt ions travel into an artifact in solution is by the process of diffusion. Diffusion describes the movement of a solute from one space to another across some sort of restrictive barrier until the two sides are balanced chemically and electrically. And in contrast, um, osmosis, which you also might have heard of, describes the movement of the solvent in response to a change in concentration of the solute. Um, and that movement happens until those concentrations are equalized or have reached an equilibrium. These processes occur in tandem um, to each other, but for simplicity's sake, we will basically only be concentrating on diffusion and the movements of the solute, i.e. the salt ions. Diffusion works through the tendency of solute particles to seek balance in regards to some type of variable, such as a difference in pressure, chemical concentration, or electrical potential, which has been disrupted by some sort of restriction or barrier. Um, restoration of this balance manifests in the gradual movement of the solute, the solute down some sort of gradient between extremes of high and low. Um, since we are discussing the movement of ions, the dominant gra gradients we are concerned with are ion concentration, also known as a chemical gradient, and electrical potential gradients. As the name implies, um, concentration gradients describe the movement of ions from an area of high concentration to one of low concentration. Um, and this happens until the ion is distributed equally. Um, furthermore, the greater the difference in ion concentration, the steeper that gradient will be and the faster the rate of diffusion is as a result. So basically the faster those particles are gonna move. And conversely, the closer the ion concentration, the shallower the gradient will be and thus the slower the rate of diffusion will be. These are mechanics to keep in mind as we will be taking advantage of them later. So in addition to our chemical gradients, there are also electrical gradients at play. As with an ion concentration gradient, electrical gradients are based on relative differences in electric potential across a separated space. Um, concentrated numbers of ions also mean concentrated numbers of relative negative or positive charge um, that will attract obsolete charged cations and anions toward those spaces until the concentrations and thus electrical charges are balanced within the solution. Together, ion chemical gradients and electric potential gradients are referred to as electrochemical gradients. Um, it is also important to note that these electrochemical gradients are relatively, are largely relative meaning the gradient differences can be quite small in the grand scheme of things and are largely based on the relationship between a particular ion and its immediate environment and the conditions therein. So how this translates into an actual artifact in an, in an underwater burial environment looks something like this. In a marine environment where chloride salts predominate, chloride ions will travel down an electrochemical gradient from an area of higher chloride concentration and negative charge i.e. the ocean, um, to one of relative lower chloride concentration and positive charge, i.e. the artifact. 
um, the ions will diffuse through the surface of the artifact, which separates the interior space of the artifact from the exterior environment by traveling through pores, cracks, pits, and other imperfections that make the artifact permeable, undergoing all the various processes as we discussed through the course of this talk along the way. Um, obviously, the more porous the artifact, the more access there is for soluble salts to travel into the artifact. As long last, we have come to the subject of desalination and how conservators remove soluble salts from artifacts. In conservation, desalination means desalting an artifact by reversing the electrochemical gradients and essentially using the mechanisms of diffusion against itself. This process may seem simple, um, but there are several factors that we need to control for in order to make desalination as effective as possible. Uh, one of which is making sure that the concentration gradients are as steep as possible. This means taking the artifact out of a salt, specifically chloride rich environment, and putting it through a series of comparatively saltless fresh water baths. Um, of course, although tap water is treated, um, it is not devoid of ions, minerals, or microbes, um, including chlorides, um, that can all impact the efficacy of these gradients. Um, instead, these materials have their own diffusion gradients and can, uh, can end up competing for pore space or altering, altering um, the electrochemical balance in ways that slows down the rate of diffusion. For this reason, instead of relying solely on tap water, we also use various types of purified or highly refined water. Um, RO water, also known as reverse osmosis water, filters out most microbes and most major mineral contaminants, and deionized and distilled waters are exceptional at removing um, competing ions and the widest range of mineral content. Um, this helps ensure a steep diffusion gradient in an effective and speedy as possible desalination um, process. Another factor that we have to take into consideration is that desalination is not risk-free, and by reintroducing or keeping wet artifacts in water baths for um, long periods of time, even highly purified ones, we can still promote renewed degradation of the artifacts, especially materials like iron, which are super reactive, and will pretty much continue to corrode as long as they have access to water, oxygen, and electrolytes into perpetuity. Um, this is especially true as we prefer to remove any concretion, any overburden, or more strenuous layers of um, corrosion material from the surface of the artifact, um, both to make the artifact more legible, um, but also to allow greater access for diffusion, and also to remove any chlorides that have accumulated inside those most superfluous layers. However, by doing this, we've also exposed more of the artifact surface, um, surface including any core metal that is still um, there, um, which basically opens it up for further corrosion processes. Um, in order to combat this, we often store and desalinate iron and other metals in a buffer solution. Since iron corrosion is propagated by acids, the buffer solutions we use to neutralize them are basic. In this situation, the ability to um, use an alkaline environment to reduce corrosion is more important than the purity of the concentration gradient, and as a result, other ions are allowed to exist. I should also point out that, um, and it is neutralized, I should also point out that many of the common types of buffer solutions we use are based on materials like sodium carbonate, which are themselves basic salts. So it has once again come around full circle. Of course, to make sure that salination is happening the way we want it to, um, we have to monitor the diffusion rate. We do this by measuring the concentration of salts that are in the water bath. Um, for most materials, we use something called a TDS or total dissolved salts meter, um, which is able to give us a very sort of generic reading of the concentration of salts in our solution. Um, but for some materials which are more sensitive to specific types of salts and salt ions like iron, we use um, material ion specific meters, um, chloride meters, for example. Um, however, eventually our diffusion gradients will approach equilibrium and even out and the diffusion rate will plateau and the measurements will start getting closer and closer together. Um, when this happens, we simply change out and replace the solution and start the process again until we have removed as much salt as is feasible. Um, but even with all these methods of manipulation, passive desalination can take a long time. It can take months, it can take years, and in some cases, even decades, depending on the size and type of artifact. The last method I'm going to talk about is a very localized type of desalination called poulticing. 
Poulticing is used in cases where an artifact may be too fragile or friable to leave or place back into a water bath. It is often used in ceramics conservation to address very localized salt efflorescence and staining issues. Um, a poultice can be comprised of a variety of materials. Um, paper pulp is very traditional. Sometimes fabrics are used. Clay is very popular as well as methyl cellulose, other types of fillers and bulking agents, and gels have re very recently become popular as well. Um, the key to a good poultice is that, first of all, it must be able to hold some measure of liquid, usually water, not necessarily to saturation, um, but at least to be effectively dampened by it. And the most important aspect of an effective poultice is that it must be more porous and thus more permeable to salt than the artifact that is being treated. Um, the poultice is then placed against the surface of the artifact, and although diffusion does occur, um, the real effect of the, of the poultice occurs as the solvent evaporates and salt and moisture are whipped away from the effect through capillary action. Um, so that is just sort of a little tidbit of a different type of desalination that is sometimes used in conservation. And to conclude this talk, I'd like to acknowledge that as effective as desalination is, it is not the be all and end all to the care of artifacts that have come through soluble salt rich environments. After desalination has reached its endpoint, there are still several steps that have to occur um, until the treatment is completed. Um, the most critical of this is that artifacts first have to survive being dried. Uh, often this takes the form of some sort of controlled drying process where we can incrementally reduce the amount of moisture in the artifact over time and reduce the negative effects of dehydration, including further efflorescence of any remaining soluble salts. Um, and despite our best efforts, most artifacts, but especially metals like iron, will require additional protections like chemical or physical coatings, um, environmental controls, and ultimately regular monitoring and maintenance to catch any sub subsequent um, soluble salt problems. Um, despite this, long-term results, including artifact longevity, are almost universally improved through the desalination. And in the end, um, desalination is well worth the time and effort to ensure the best quality of life and access we can for our artifacts. And in case you are pursuing any of these topics in more detail or further, here are some um, good recommendations for some, some articles and resource books that you might find useful. Um, and thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, if you would like more similar content, I have another installment in the lecture series coming out on May 5th, 2021, titled It's Electrifying Conservation Basics, Electrolytic Reduction and Archaeological Conservation, in which we will expand on some of the topics that we um, talked about here, including a different type of desalination, a more active type of desalination that uses electrodes um, to get the job done. Um, also, I'd like to give a shout out to my colleague, Christine Brind, who will be the next up in our Maritime Heritage series on March 4th um, with her presentation by Hook or by Crook, um, which is a presentation focusing on the female pirates Anne, Bonnie, and Ari Mary Reed. Um, this presentation will explore the lives of misbehaving women of the 18th century, so hope to see you there. <laughs>